So there's really no um, certainty about our origins. Uh, even within the last, I think, two or three months, like a new, like older uh, ancestor of Homo sapiens was discovered. So we're, we're constantly learning about our history from what we uncover. I think that the there were some some uh, remains of uh, Homo sapien found in the continental United States. I think somewhere somewhere in North America that proves that this continent was inhabited by humans a lot earlier than previously thought. So with all these debates, like who traveled from where and which land bridge and all that stuff, but there are certain things that we have a pretty basic understanding of, uh, which is that uh, there was a time before we were domesticating plants and growing them in place. So we were gathering wild foods, uh, wild plants, wild animals. And so our lifestyle was really dependent on following our food source. And so that would mean both uh, following, going up and down in elevation to follow plant um, blossoms and berries and, and things like that, and also following the migration of the animals. And a lot of times this would be on a pattern uh, with the seasons. So summertime, higher up, wintertime, lower down. And as we continue to learn about the history of the Willamette Valley, especially in light of the fires that happened recently that are still burning a little bit, when we really take a close look, we recognize that Humans and the environment here have had a long-standing relationship, and fire has been one of those main sort of um, influences of humans on the landscape. And uh, Tom Ward, who's a teacher of mine, who we'll hopefully see later in the course, uh, says that really, you can if you define humans compared to like all the other species on the planet, he says the 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 best way to define them is that we make messes. That's what we do. <laughs> And he says some messes are actually really good messes. Some of them are really helpful. And uh, it's, it's making the right kind of mess that's helpful to nature. And so there's certain human disturbance. Just like if, you, if you're a gardener and you know that picking the plant encourages its growth, there are certain uh, kinds of uh, influence that have a positive benefit. Now that's what we're really trying to go for in permaculture. And so we, can, we don't have to look any further than the Willamette Valley for indicators of that long-standing relationship and what happens when you remove fire from an environment that has had fire for you know, potentially thousands of years, uh, you end up with a scenario that uh, is out of balance. And so there's a lot of work now being done on trying to figure out how we can reincorporate fire into the landscape because the Limit Valley was maintained as a very open uh, grassland, mostly like oak savanna type grassland, uh, which is excellent for hunting. Uh, that was maintained by human caused fire, uh, intentional fire. So we have this long relationship and there's really not been a time in the last several thousand years where humans and the environment were separate. So this whole notion of you know, keep certain uses out of the national park because we need to preserve it the way that it was is based on a false premise that people weren't there influencing that place when it was discovered by white settlers. That's really big. Uh, there are so many indicators. You know, uh, Steve Johnson talks about here on this land you can find shards of obsidian. And so what does that tell you? Just if you know anything about geology, if you're finding obsidian here, here yeah, it was brought here. We don't have obsidian in the Portland area. That's from Eastern Oregon. And so uh, there, was, there was a lot of uh, movement and a lot of trade. And uh, so the more we understand the history of people in place, the better we'll have an understanding of how far we've come from our relationship with place. <coughs> And also debatable, but <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that Egypt had a really strong influence in how humans in relationship with land evolved because one of the hallmarks of Egyptian society was the ability to grow more food than is needed that can be effectively stored until the next year. And that was primarily possible through grain crops. So grain crops did this crazy thing to our um, evolution development where uh, it made it possible for us to stay in one place reliably. So even if you're growing vegetables and you're in one place and you have a really bad year, whether it's flood or too hot, that can be really detrimental. And so it can it, it means that there's still a bit of a nomadic edge where you have these alternative food sources around you, but 
with the growth of like wheat in, in this case and rice in other places uh, and corn in other places, the ability to store that up for like an emergency fund kind of thing um, really allowed for the development of cities and the establishment of cities saying like, okay, we can be permanently here for a really long time because we have this reliable food source. But that created some really interesting dynamics socially too because now for the first time in a magnitude that wasn't present before, there was a need to protect those stores of food from people and animals who wanted them. So there's your first army. Um, and there's also the birth of mathematics to track. Um, maybe not the ultimate birth of mathematics, but <clears throat> mathematics as we know it to, uh, to budget and account and track the stores of grain and stuff like that. And the Egyptians had incredibly elaborate transport systems for their grain. Some of the largest barges ever, besides these super tankers that crossed the ocean, uh, were Egyptian barges that were bringing rice up and down the, uh, the Nile River. Incredibly advanced society. We still can't figure out how they did what they did with the pyramids. And um, it's thought that the growth of the human brain, as we kind of progress through time, was really fueled by the protein of these grain crops. So like our ability to be such thinkers was kind of born out of these grain crops. So that's an important part of our history uh, with agriculture. Um, now let's see. I know it's, it's a little, little weak there, but this is a picture of a shepherd. And um, sometimes people incorrectly refer to the sort of pastoral, nomadic, shepherding kind of um, relationship with land as what came before what we know as agriculture, and that's not true. They actually existed in parallel for a really long time. And uh, a teacher of mine, uh, Martin Pactel, in, uh, who lives in New Mexico, uh, points out an interesting case. And he paints a picture of uh, the sort of Eurasian landscape as uh, lots of nomadic uh, folks, um, primarily in the grasslands and the steppe, and then the settled folks that are building the cities. And um, we, we have all seen pictures of, and maybe some of us have visited, the Great Wall of China. And what I was taught in school was that the Great Wall of China was meant to keep like, nomadic people out of the city, uh, keep attackers out of the city. And uh, Martin Pactel offers a different viewpoint on the possibility of what that wall was for, and he says that he believes that that wall was to keep the Chinese from leaving the city and joining the nomadic lifestyle, because there was a desirability to it. Very, very different perspective on it. But uh, it's true that there would be uh, a lot of nomadic folks, a lot of uh, settled folks, and a lot of movement in between. And uh, it's just sort of been this part of our history. And to this day, there continues to be uh, nomadic people who haven't lost those traditional ways. So a lot of our history, and this is sort of like the classic textbook stuff, um, we hear about the, um, the Tigris and the Euphrates, the cradle of civilization. Well, certainly there are some really old roots of our ancestry, our human ancestry, in this place. Um, but as Mark likes to bring out in the mythology, there's oftentimes a lot of really awesome information. And uh, history a lot of times gets reshaped and, and deleted and edited and all this stuff. But a lot of times it's the stories that preserve the actual history of uh, what had happened. <laughs> And so, uh, how many of you are familiar with the Epic of Gilgamesh? How many of you are familiar with the Epic of Gilgamesh? Oh, yes. A handful? Okay. So this is a really old story uh, where we've got uh, Umbaba, which is the protector spirit of the forest. Now, uh, there was a time when the Fertile Crescent, which is now mostly desert, was also a forest, a cedar forest to be exact. And that forest was cut to build the, the early versions of these cities. And that deforestation is what inevitably kicked into uh, action this process of soil loss and desertification. Uh, that's happened a lot of times, a lot of places in history. And I'll reference that again. Uh, and then you've got uh, this guy, Gilgamesh, right? Who, in an effort to retrieve this timber resource from the forest at the rates that the city needed it, he needed to conquer the um, protector of the forest, Mbaba. And so uh, a version of the story is that Mbaba is killed, Gilgamesh is able to harvest the wood from the forest, and uh, that's the story. And um, here there's some images of a uh, Middle Eastern city, oil field, uh, some fire stacks from oil refinery, and uh, a tank with some soldiers. And the fertility of this area is evidenced by the petroleum that's underground now. So uh, that 
fossil fuel, whether it's coal or oil or whatever, um, that is like the compressed hydrocarbons of plant and animal matter from you know thousands and perhaps millions of years of accumulation. And the, the exact kind of geomorphic process of that, uh, that's not an area of my expertise, but um, in order to have that underground resource, it had to have been a highly fertile, highly productive place before that. And so now we're drawing up that fertility and of course I don't have to talk too much about um, the impacts of the, the burning of all those fossil fuels and I'll, I'll reference that in a little bit but now what we're basically doing is uh, putting back in the atmosphere hundreds of thousands of years of uh, carbon that had been captured and stored taken out of the air talk about that so fast forwarding just a little bit to England there's no virgin forest in England, which means that uh, every old tree has been cut down. All the forests that are there now have been regrown since uh, sort of England's uh, Industrial Revolution time frame. There are some damn big trees there. There are some big trees. <laughs> yeah, but they're not virgin forests. And really the rise of industry marks a significant point in our history where um, Emphasis shifts to really condensed urban areas. There's more emphasis on production, more need for uh, manufacturing of metals and metal implements. So there's a lot of uh, trees being cut down for making charcoal. Charcoal production is a huge thing. And then uh, these factories that would um, either be producing metal or producing goods uh, that are utilizing metal. And uh, this is where population starts to kind of take this uptick. And because England had no more big trees, but they wanted to really ha remain established as a, a sort of global power, uh, they needed to find some new mast trees for our shipbuilding. And so uh, one of the discoveries upon uh, arriving to what we call the United States on the East Coast was that there are these gloriously large trees, a lot of pine and stuff. And so, um, I might have a slide in here in a little bit too, but I'll mention it anyways, that uh, the King of England would actually have uh, the folks who were coming across for, on behalf of the King to find all the biggest trees and put a mark on them to say, like, this is the property of the King, and if you were to cut down that tree or do something with that tree, then you would be punished accordingly, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, sort of like the expansion of empire to the United States has also a really big part of our history, not just socially, but um, agriculturally, because uh, we decided that, when I say we, I'm referencing um, the white settlers, decided that it was God's will, it was God's will for us to go from one coast to the other, and it was God's will for us to eliminate anything that was in our way. And so uh, this is a picture of Miss Manifest Destiny herself, Mark referenced her just a little bit yesterday, uh, portrayed as this sort of white robe floating over the plains, like you can hear like the angelic music kind of a thing. And behind her comes a train, um, comes a wagon, settlers coming across the country, and uh, fleeing are the buffalo, fleeing are the Indians, and fleeing are some of the other animals. And so this period of the American frontier is also a very big part of the story of the settlement of this country and the agricultural system that replaced the perennial uh, food forest and foraging systems that uh, weren't always recognized, but were very much a part of the landscape of North America. Uh, kind of embedding in the culture of like cowboy good, Indian bad, this whole Buffalo Bills Wild West thing, like this was a, a traveling show where, you know, the story over and over again where, I mean, it's propaganda, really, and the propaganda to, to kind of normalize things that are really not normal and quite fucked up uh, has persisted. So this is saying, like, uh, you know, and you see this in, in movies in the 50s, too, where, like, the little kids playing Cowboy and Indian, a Christmas story, right? I mean, it's, it's embedded in American culture and media that um, the cowboy conquers the Indian. Right? That's, that's the story. And that also really informs how we relate to place. And uh, part of that manifest destiny, you know, what, what you don't see in that painting of the woman floating across the country um, is the, the deforestation as the train would come. Um, the train for, for indigenous people signifies death. It signifies um, the arrival of uh, 
destructive forces, it's, uh, sometimes called the snake. And uh, so the rails and the expansion of the railway across the country is what really accelerated this westward expansion. And the train is the extractor, right? The train comes in and loads up in these. And so when trains come into a place, like in other countries that um, haven't had a rail, when the train comes, that's usually like a point in history where uh, things begin to change really quickly. This is a picture, 1620, generally the area of virgin forest, and you know pretty much the places that aren't dark here are places where uh, it's more desert type climate and forests don't really grow. And uh, here's a picture of Portland in the early 1900s, stump town, you know, not a whole lot of trees remaining. By 1926. This is the remaining extent of the virgin forest in the United States. So I'll go back to the original one, from there to there. And then uh, some of the big boys, some of the big trees here, uh, also became remarkably desirable. And for actually a time, I worked in Sequoia National Park, and there's lots of information about how uh, these big trees would be taken down and, you know, it's kind of crazy that now, really, just remnants of some of these ancient, ancient forests. Uh, Sequoia National Park being one of them, Yosemite being another one of them, and there are others, and there are, you know, there are redwood forests that are uh, old growth forests too, but um, really don't have a lot left. And so now, the areas that there are these, we sort of put a boundary around them and say, okay, gotta preserve this. These are all the things you can't do. But still, like what kept that place healthy and thriving was the human influence. Uh, what kept the sequoia stands vibrant and healthy and regenerating was a fire cycle. Uh, I worked with the park fire ecologist and between every 25 and 75 years, some of these forests would burn and that would do a lot for the sequoia trees who depend on fire actually. So it's not uncommon for a sequoia tree to be as wide as this table. Uh, this is actually kind of a small one and their bark can be up to 32 inches thick and that's to withstand the heat of the fire and their seeds require fire to germinate. And uh, we, we had put out so many of the fires up until the 1970s that there really were no new sequoia uh, groves sprouting. And this was noticed. And the Park Service has begun to change the way they engage with it. Uh, but this has been our sort of treatment, which is that we think we know best. We don't like fire because it destroys something that's valuable to us, which is the lumber. So we're going to take it out without really understanding the role that it had. So really up until the 1900s, the early 1900s, all farming was done with human power and animal power uh, because there, there weren't the technologies yet to have the big tractors. So um, it wouldn't be too uncommon for a farm to have several hundred horse to pull some rather large implements as agricultural techniques advanced. The machines got fancy, but they weren't combustion engines or they weren't steam engines yet. So they were still driven by animals, okay? So agriculture, uh, in this sense, still had this sort of relationship between animals and humans. It was more land-based. It wasn't like a noisy agricultural process. Uh, so here's the uh, development of some of these earlier mechanisms. We're still animal-drawn, but uh, vastly increases the amount of area that can be uh, plowed, planted, harvested in a certain amount of time. And so that's basically supporting the increase in productivity of land, trying to maximize that. But not always with um, understanding of the capacity of the soil. This is in the Columbia River Valley. This is a columbine that's uh, cutting wheat. And this is drawn by like a 20 or 30 horse team. <clears throat> not uncommon. 30 horsepower. Yeah. And interestingly, uh, I think I have a little message that pops up to remind me to say this, but uh, the term horsepower was a ploy to get farmers to switch from their trusty horses, because if you're a farmer and you've got horses, they're your life, they're your blood, they're your, you know, your, your livelihood, and so why would you give them up? So the marketing effort to get farmers to switch from using actual horses to using this machine was to create a horsepower equivalent that's where horsepower came from. And that was marketed by James Watt, the same guy who, you know, Watt out, Watt like all the incentives. Um, he, was, he was also marketing the engine. 
so some of these early uh, power-driven uh, machines that did replace horses, uh, the very first ones were steam, and then the ones that followed that were combustion engines. And the technology of the tractors themselves were really informed by uh, wartime advances. So tank technology in times of peace would go into developing you know, newer farm equipment and that's that's been the case for a really long time in a lot of countries. Here's uh, after World War II, here's dad in his tank of a tractor and his little kid with a sort of smaller scale matching version, you know. Good old boy just like his dad, right? Yeah. Check this thing out. All of a sudden, our relationship with land is starting to look and sound very different. Very different. We're approaching land now as if we're at war with it, as opposed to having reverence for it. Animal-based land tending is a lot more based on like life and vitality and things that grow and making sure that uh, everything stays healthy. This is a system where you can actually neglect the health and keep doing what you're doing for a time. Real, real interesting looking machines that do all kinds of things, right? If you've ever driven through uh, an agricultural country, you've seen a lot of the different kinds of tractors. And so this is really aimed at efficiency and productivity, but there is an expense. One of those is our connection with the land. Another is our ability to observe when something's out of balance and our, our ability to do something about it. So tractor technology is pretty fancy now. Uh, some I think are even like running on GPS. And I remember going to Disney World when I was a kid, and there's this I think Epcot Center maybe, and there's this exhibit of uh, robotic farming, you know. And like everybody is like at that time is like, whoa, this is so amazing. Wouldn't that be cool? Like, not cool. <laughs> what happens when we become completely disconnected from the actual growing of the food? That's kind of a scary thought. I was yeah. talking to an, an organic farmer that I was working with, and he, he's an inspector and goes to all this, whatever, all over the country, and he was talking about how in the larger monocrop operations that the driver now effectively is just a, a, a fail-safe, that mm -hmm. he just sits. Yeah. And there's like an afford, basically, that's like, stop, you've gone off your GPS, <laughs> and then they can manually override it, but the, their hour-to-hour yeah. -hour job is just to sit and like read it. Just and I'll wait. bet that's not even really the farmer. In most cases, it's you know a, a hired employee. Mm -hmm. Farmers nowadays are so much less actually in the soil, and they're a lot more effectively like equipment managers and personnel managers. Uh, many of them uh, are indebted to banks quite severely, and this is not a presentation on the global bank system. We'll do finance later in the course, but it's also really directly connected. Uh, in order to have this kind of equipment, there needs to be um, bank loans and that kind of stuff, and so a lot of farmers get hooked on owing a lot of money to banks in order to have the latest and greatest and so on and so forth. Okay, first big indicator as a young country came in the 1930s where after really extensive farming and a drought, a lot of the loose topsoil and, and of course uh, some pretty gnarly windy weather, topsoil literally blew away. Feet of topsoil blew away and of course got deposited in other places so you see this wagon wheel completely covered. So this was the Dust Bowl of the 30s, over tillage, drought. Um, this should have been more of a wake-up call than it was. This did put us into a recession. Um, coming out of the dust, yes? Um, if you could talk about what topsoil is. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, well, the, the simple version without spoiling our fun for the soils class is that uh, if you dig down, say this dig down five feet, uh, the first foot to a foot and a half is going to be really dark brown. It's a really active layer. That's where a lot of the microbes are. That's where the worms are. That's where all of the organic material that's on the top is being broken down and pulled in by all the critters and stuff. So it's really rich. It has a higher organic content. And then below that, a lot of times there's a pretty distinctive color transition where it's too deep for microbes and these animals to, to live. Some can get deep, but uh, it becomes more of a pure mineral soil. So it doesn't have plant matter in it. It's more just like the, the actual um, mineral structure. So the topsoil is that living layer of soil that's really essential. A healthy topsoil um, 
well, first of all, it has plants growing on it. <laughs> and so those plants and their roots hold it in place. When we farm, what we're doing is we're taking that layer of topsoil, we're slicing into it and flipping it. This is like a you know conventional agriculture approach. We're disking it, flipping it on its head. That's really efficient for weeding and for preparing soil for planting, but that also makes it really vulnerable. It's also taking, uh, as you go down, actually I have this really cool book that I picked up this weekend that I'll show you. It goes, talks all about roots. It's on that table back there. Um, as you go deeper in the soil, the oxygen content drops, the, the amount of things that can survive drops. But there are some things that live deeper that are better at living in low oxygen conditions. Actually, ox high amount of oxygen can be toxic to them, and the things on the top love oxygen, and being deprived of oxygen will harm them. What we do is we flip them on their heads. So we're putting the soil ecology into a state of chaos, and if that happens over and over and over again, uh, what we'll, we're effectively doing is killing the life of the topsoil. Then the soil doesn't have what we call tilth. You've heard of organ tilth, you've heard of washing tilth. <coughs> tilth is a word that describes the texture of soil. If it's tilthy, it's fluffy. It's like it's got air in it. It's it's alive. Soil that has poor tilth is just really compacted or it's just like really crumbly, doesn't have that life. And so what we've done to every major agriculturally productive valley in the country, except well, I'm still doing it too, but the Willamette Valley here is like actually one of the last rich fertile valleys in the country because we've like kind of ruined the rest of them. There's a reason why we're not growing all of like the really rich vegetables like uh, in like the Midwest uh, because really like the, we've depleted fertility of a lot of these places. Um, this, this process of trying to get as many yields out as possible is effectively killing the soil. So what those bugs do, what all those critters, the bacteria, the microorganisms, um, is that they're taking old plant matter, they're breaking it down and making it available for other plants to use. So there's this embedded compost action happening in healthy soil. And when you kill the soil through over tillage, through over plowing, through over farming, um, the plants won't grow as well anymore. So what's the solution? We've got to figure out what to put on it to get that productivity back up. And that's not a new thing. Farmers have been putting manure on their crops for a long time. But this is the first time that we've, we've in the 50s particularly, again, this is post-World War II, a lot of wartime technologies converted to um, civil um, applications. We basically concentrated, like extracted and concentrated fertilizer using um, petroleum products to replace what the microorganisms in the soil would be naturally producing, which is all the, the nutrients that the plants need, but also when we have these huge vast tracts of one kind of plant and a bug that really likes that one kind of plant gets introduced into the system, <clears throat> that's, that's a disaster. You know, that's when you have uh, massive crop loss. And so with the expansion of farms, the growth of farms, all this machinery making it possible to do like hundreds of acres in a day, you've got a huge liability. You know, a huge area of one crop is a huge liability. And so the, the direction that uh, we went in and the direction that a lot of the world has gone in is to apply uh, pesticides to kill those bugs before they destroy the crops. And so we got caught on the cycle of needing to have increasingly intensive applications of um, fertilizers to supplant what would have naturally been produced if the soil had not been killed. Uh, and pesticides to kill the bugs that are like, woohoo, party time! And um, also herbicides and things to kill their weeds and just to make the process more efficient. And this really, this really took off in a huge way in the 1950s. There's some neat things, uh, I believe, I haven't verified this personally, but I believe that there are some logging practices that are happening in the Warm Springs Reservation that uh, they'll come in in the wintertime yeah. and log mm -hmm. so as to not actually disturb the surface of the, the forest. They'll, they'll so come in on the snow. That's, that's so yeah, definitely compacting soil is a big issue. Um, you know, I think just uh, monocropping and the application of chemical herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers combined with uh, compaction, combined with not understanding that soil is really what we're growing. Think about this. Soil is what we're growing and food is the surplus. That's a permaculture perspective on agriculture. A conventional perspective on agriculture is that we use the soil to grow food. Soil is an object. It's not something to be really cultivated. That's a generalization, but that's generally true. So this, uh, there's a phase, and it doesn't sound nearly as sexy. Uh, it's, it's not nearly as sexy as it sounds. Uh, it's referred to as the Green Revolution. Uh, this is a time when uh, 
one of the ways that America was seeing itself as a kind of world global savior was to uh, export this agricultural technology of chemical herbicides and pesticides to a lot of other places around the world. Uh, one of them was India, actually. India was experiencing um, uh, a food shortage, and America's like, oh, we can save the day, check this out. And that's just like one version of a lot of uh, ways that um, this agricultural system pushed out more traditional farming methods, including seed saving and like not even going to get into like Monsanto and that kind of stuff uh, in this presentation, but it's a pattern that's repeated itself over and over again. Uh, how can we uh, get a bigger market share by employing our technology and uh, growing the dependence on that technology? And once you get caught on this cycle, it's really hard to come out of, which is why actually uh, if a farmer is going to convert back to organic, they pretty much know that for two or three years their productivity is going to go down because <coughs> what they're doing is waiting for the soil life to regrow. So the soil life can then carry the, the, um, the, the nutrient need of the, of the crops. So we've got all these fancy ways of applying these chemicals, uh, even aerially. Uh, some of our friends at Gearcrest Farm, they're running this organic farm. They're surrounded by uh, grass fields for like seed, and they're aerial, aerially sprayed, and like they can't do anything about that. And so, I mean, this stuff knows no boundary. This is one of the big challenges of uh, applying strong chemicals to one place is that it never stays in that one place. In Sequoia National Park, the tallest mountain in the continental, or the lower 48 states, um, Mount Whitney, uh, they have an air quality measuring station near the top of Mount Whitney, and uh, they've, they've sampled the presence of pesticides on the top of Mount Whitney that are only used in China. Okay, so this stuff doesn't know about boundary or border. Uh, and it's not just in the air, it's in, you know, it's in water as well. And we went from having a relationship with land where hands were in the soil and people were around and there was song and there was, there was just like a village kind of presence to what is now effectively uh, a contaminated zone of food production. <laughs> That's kind of scary if you think about it. Uh, keep out danger. Food being grown here. Is that cotton or what? Uh, not sure exactly. <laughs> Maybe it looks like potatoes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Seek medical help if you touch it. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, There's an internet meme going around. Like, these are guys on Mars. You know, spraying oh, this. Oh, wait, no, they're spraying they this. They yeah. Well, DDT was a crazy one, too. Um, yeah. We won't get into that. <laughs> Population growth. Uh, has anybody studied population dynamics or taken like ecology as a subject in college? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the only other scenario? What's what's the what's the only scenario that happens with this kind of curve? Dramatic drop. Yeah. In population dynamics, if you have exponential growth, you will always have exponential. Yeah. yeah. Down the other side. Um, this is the reality that nobody wants to freaking talk about. And actually, permaculture used to have a little bit more of an edge around this, but I think we've gotten a little soft. I think we're, we're um, having a hard time with so much inundation of what's wrong that it's hard to grasp that perhaps in our lifetime, we're going to experience uh, a plateau of population. And if it's not in our lifetime, it'll definitely be in our children's lifetime. Okay. There's just not a way to maintain this. Okay. So we went from, you know, a half a billion people in 1000 AD to you know approaching maybe eight or more billion in the next uh, 10 years or so. What are we at now? It's like seven point something. Like I remember I was in college when we hit six and I don't even remember when we hit seven. So in my lifetime the population of the world has grown by almost two billion people. You know? Right. So you have been around for a doubling of the global population. I mean, that, that kind of is a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of people. And is the implication of that then that there's no way around a precipitous amount of sudden death? Is that much? I would say that uh, it's going to be either something that we plan and design for or something that slaps in the face. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll address it just a little bit in a, in a sec here. So this spike, the spike in population growth um, also traces the spike in oil extraction because our ability to uh, have this many people is directly connected to our dependence on the energy that we get from fossil fuels. And uh, to keep this presentation short enough, there's a lot of things I have to abridge. One of those is that uh, oil, fossil fuels, uh, became a new form of slavery. So before <laughs> we were fossil fuel dependent, we actually relied on forced labor to get a lot of the work done because empires cannot function without slaves. I'll say it again. Empires cannot function without slaves. And so what we've just done is we've enslaved a different thing. Okay. So this oil is doing the hard labor for us. Uh, and there's not a backup plan for what happens when we don't have access to that anymore. So if we zoom way out, way, way out, like, here we are, everybody. <laughs> That's where we are right now. And there are a lot of factors that are contributing to that. I have a car, I drive, I'm contributing to that. Like there are a lot of freaking cars in the world and there's a lot of fuel that's going to cars. There's a lot of fuel that's going to, um, you know, industrial uses and agricultural production and so much is dependent on fuel. If fuel stops coming, food doesn't get around. We're a global food system too. And so our whole agricultural system is married to cheap access to fuel eerily similar to what happened in 2008 with the housing crisis? Think about this for a sec. If you are in a position of power and you know that if you weaken the system, you will weather it, a lot of, a lot of others will not, and you will gain, does that give you incentive to rig the system? Hell yes it does. It does. This pattern here, economic crisis, number of family farmers sharply drops, the number of corporate farms goes up pretty fast. The amount of land, check this out, the amount of land in production since the 20s has not changed that much. What, what we're able to produce from that land has changed, so feeding a growing population has really hinged on um, finding ways to have more productivity from the land, which has led us down the road of a lot of these inputs, right, to maximize that. Um, so yeah, so here's the sort of point where uh, these lines cross where the number of farms is plummeting and um, the acres per farm is skyrocketing. And that's really only possible in, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, I had to do it. We're talking about um, our food system and so it's, it's owned by ma major corporations and uh, the, the, the pattern, the sort of We'll talk a lot about patterns. That's, that's, that's a pattern of this course, and we're actually going to do a, a little thing on patterns today. Uh, but the pattern is that major companies, in order to stay in power, and it's, it's a competition thing, like you have to be more powerful than your um, uh, com competition. So you either buy them or you gather enough other companies to outcompete them. Yes? pretty wild. Yeah. So uh, the corporate model is one where uh, decisions are made not by people who really have any relationship or connection with what's actually happening and what impact that has. Uh, the decisions are made by, and this is by law, a group of uh, a board who's entrusted to make decisions for the corporation who are a lot of times invested in that company. And so the performance, economic performance of that company is their driving incentive. And then, you know, a, a public corporation is one where there are shares that are sold and everybody's rooting for the company that has their shares. And so uh, board membership, the pressure is really to, to maximize profit. It's a, max, it's a profit maximizing model, which on the other side of that means that um, the shit end of the stick is the health of the people, the health of the soil. That's the model that we're in, okay? And... couple pictures of some supermarkets here. Uh, this type of system has not um, 
been kept out of the organic food market. Either. So, even sometimes when we're shopping organic and trying to make a choice, of course for the, wanting to have healthier food, but also I think people buy organic because they want to kind of vote with their dollar on how the food's being grown, but that's actually not always the case. Because a lot of those major companies also own and buy up these organic companies because uh, it's, it's a economically sound decision to invest where people are spending their dollars. So uh, because people want it, there's the market. And so, yeah, and this is, uh, I updated this for this presentation and it's still not that current. I replaced an older slide. This is 2007. Uh, you hear all the time, like, I remember when I was in grad school, Old Walla got bought out by Coca-Cola, Coca -Cola. Um, Hidden Valley Farms, who owns Hidden Valley Farms? You know, it's probably in here somewhere. Uh, the majority of the organic companies are owned by major corporations that also are heavily invested in a lot of other junky stuff. Can you Yeah, yeah, you guys can have these presentations. Yes? So, how do you see our future changing? This. Ah, hold on to your seat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm like, this is totally the best thing. I've touched on it, but I've touched on already. The next step is that I think agriculture has been from producing plant-based food for people to produce feed for animals to a large degree. Well, and biofuel also. And which is kind of and actually, a dilemma. And so that has changed a good part of agriculture as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Because we are moving in a, into a completely different mm -hmm. business there. Yeah. And, well, and that is that. I think we didn't have that there, but I think we, we always Hold have on to your seat, too. I, 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 <laughs> I'm not no, done yet. I, and I'm not, I'm not saying no. vegan or, or, or right. vegetarian, but I think that's a big part of how agriculture has changed. Because we need to grow a lot more feed yeah. than food, yeah. than plant-based food. Yeah, it doesn't just stop there, but the whole biofuel thing too, growing plants for creating fuel, it's almost all GMO and it's basically taking up, you know, a share of the land that's currently in production. So it's there's a dilemma there. Okay, I, I apologize that it's a little bit difficult to see, but uh, what we're looking at here, so there, uh, there was a study that was done, asked people, what do you think the distribution of wealth is? What do you think would be oh, equitable? One to ten. Right, and so um, let's see if I can find the lines here. Um, there's this there's this line here that kind of goes up like this. It's what people think that the dis distribution of wealth should be. There's a bigger line that's what people think it is, and what it actually is is this. So like we really have no context for how grossly disproportionate this wealth is, and this wealth distribution is sort of like the, what I've just talked about with corporations and farming and the consolidation. This is a model that's actually moved on to a lot of other um, types of business, but uh, this is only possible in this extractive system. Yeah. I just wanted to point out that I've seen this graph. Yeah. And that the top of that line is actually about two feet It goes in about here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the only yeah. reason for that is because the scale got so out of whack that you couldn't see the bottom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's true. <laughs> the actual, you know, the richest 1%, like their, their line is way up here. So what this kind of showed is that people have no idea how bad it actually is. Right. I won't get too much into this stuff, but uh, going back to oil. So we've hit peak oil. I know we hit peak oil in... The year 2000 because my dad the year i was born um, diversified from working for his dad my grandpa who had a home improvement business to becoming a fuel oil delivery person so my dad started a business called bebo fuel oil he delivered uh, home heating fuel to houses in new england in the winter time and to construction equipment in the summertime so that's what kind of fed my family and uh, when i was in college my dad would send me He'd love to send me things in the mail. He'd send me like little salami and Parmesan cheese, a little note, 50 bucks, whatever. I know when those packages stopped coming, that's when we hit peak freaking oil. I'm not kidding you. That's when we hit it, 2000. And what ended up sort of happening is that there was this rush to figure out how we can replace the dwindling um, rates of, of crude oil extraction. So there are different kinds of oil, different kinds of fuel. 
Just like there's like oil and coal, there's uh, sweet crude oil. A lot of times it's from the Middle East. Uh, requires less refining. Uh, there's dirty crude oil, or I don't know what another name for it is, where it requires more refining. The tar sands up in Canada, it's literally oil saturated sand that needs to get processed. It's a very energy intensive process. And shale oil and shale gas, which is what we call fracking or hydraulic fracturing, where in order to fill this gap of the dwindling easy oil, we drill into the ground, crack rock so that the gases and oils that are embedded in that rock can escape. We blow steam into it sometimes to pull it out and then suck it up with other pipes. And if you, as you can imagine, um, it takes a lot more energy to do that in return. So part of the reason why um, fuel prices have been so low is that one of the big oil conglomerates in the Middle East, OPEC, OPEC, uh, have been pushing the prices low to basically try to kill the fracking industry because it's easier for them than it is for fracking for profit margins. So if they drive the prices down, fracking all of a sudden becomes not profitable anymore. And so uh, there are two states in the United States that have had uh, more population growth than any other state. Oregon, mainly because of Portland, and the Dakotas because of fracking. I think South Dakota specifically. Um, so we're replacing this dwindling return with the uh, um, crude oil with these kinds of fuels. And it's a really gnarly um, process, both in terms of the tar sands and uh, the fracking. Um, there are pictures of people whose tap water has so much methane in it that they can light it on fire. Um, and if you've ever seen you know, what it looks like after a tar sands operation goes through, it's like a different planet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're we're breaking the ground. Uh -huh. um, so this shale oil, also sometimes referred to as tight oil, um, look how much is from 2000 when we hit peak oil. Um, that technology it was starting to get implemented and then really took off uh, to fill that gap. And you know, Obama was all about like you know we're going to be an oil exporter now, and uh, a lot of environmental protections were. Um, no longer protecting us because of the perceived necessity of supplanting the dwindling reserves with this kind. So it's like, it proves to me, it sh what that shows me is that while there are even some protections that are still in place, when the time comes, they become really vulnerable to feeding the beast, <laughs> to keeping this thing going, right? So huge expansion in the shale oil, huge expans expansion in shale gas, and um, this is some of the most ecologically destructive. Uh, forms of uh, fossil fuel extraction. And so with all of the other sources, you know, all of the calculations of the reserves, with all of them predicting a major tapering in the next hundred years, what will actually fill this void? Are we literally going to frack the hell out of our planet to, to continue that? It's really not possible. Um, consequence of burning all of these uh, fuels and, of course, other things combined with that, uh, here's some projections on global temperature increase uh, going out to about 2100. So in our children's lifetime, there could be a two to five degree uh, increase in temperature, which uh, if you correlate that to what happens, uh, not just freaky weather and uh, a lot of challenge with growing food and a lot of plants and animals being totally out of whack, uh, but sea level rise, pretty major. So uh, I don't know if you can see it, but here's where Florida used to be. Oh, shit, that sucks. Um, Central Valley inundated. It's been inundated before. Uh, processes happen in cycles, but uh, this would be the first time that it was caused by uh, human beings. Uh, Amazon becomes inland sea. And of course, the most vulnerable are the island countries and the island states. Britain shrinks a whole bunch. This is how far in the future? This is just like. Um, these are from, I think, National Geographic. I think this is with like a, a four degree or five degree rise. Uh, this is how we can expect the sea level to rise based on the melting of the ice. And actually, what I don't have in here is one of the most recent temperature maps of the world where it shows a lot of uh, higher than average temperature in a lot of places, but then one little pocket of colder than average uh, right between sort of like New England and uh, England. And that, that's got scientists really worried. This is sort of like, this is a new indicator of how 
uh, how much trouble we're in. Yeah, because there's this, and, and I'm always going to refer to a presentation that we'll have later to kind of save the juicy details, but um, there are underwater currents that bring warm and cold water to different places, and that ocean temperature, based on those currents, affects climate. And so uh, the whole reason why England is not uh, covered in ice is because of this kind of uh, conveyor belt in the ocean and this cold pocket, the only place that has seen a decrease in temperature is an indicator that that conveyor belt is slowing down. Because when the, when the mm -hmm. ice melts off of the glaciers, it dilutes the salinity of the ocean, and it's the salinity mm -hmm. that uh, kind of drives this conveyor, and so it's sort of like a, it's an uh-oh moment right now. I don't know how else to say it besides that, like, we're seeing it in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a lot that's unknown, and there's a lot that no, we're not the, being told the, also. The layer, right? So I would say maybe, if I were to guess, a crowd of permies, oh, yeah. probably half the folks are pretty convinced that there's some pretty major um, climate modification, like human climate modification going on, like spraying. Uh, it's not really a public secret. It's just the Cloud extent that we don't know about. That? Yeah, so um, we're basically trying to reflect energy coming into the planet back out of space. The extent of this program is what's debatable, not that it exists. Um, state of the world, so here's a couple of things that, some things take longer to kick into effect than others, so like there's a delay, okay? So um, we probably haven't hit peak pollution yet. Here's like year 2000, here's 2100, here's like 2050. Um, this is just sort of like a, if we keep going the way that we are, uh, peak pollution really, we're, we're kind of ramping up there. Uh, industrial output is kind of potentially peaking. Population will peak out shortly after that. Uh, food production and industrial output are really intimately connected there. And resources, you know, we're in a curve of depletion here. So it's sort of like multi-angled snapshot of, of kind of where we're at. And here's where it becomes a bit of our role to figure out what to do. So this is the similar curve that I showed before. Here we are sitting at the top, and the top's interesting. It's not just like you hit a boink and then come back down like you just like threw like a ball up into the air. Um, it really starts to waver at the top, and so we see that in a number of indicators. We see that in uh, kind of global weirding. We see that in uh, oil prices. Uh, whenever a system is about to turn, it, ha it reaches this point of instability. So. Uh, we're in this kind of weird, like, up and down right now, but that trend is that we're coming down the other side pretty soon. Um, one story that we're being sold is that we can uh, develop our ways out of this problem. <laughs> that we can create technologies that will um, make it possible for us to continue to grow exponentially. Sure. Right, which is freaking crazy. That defies all <clears throat> laws of nature. Like, we could try like heck, but it could never happen. You know, that's why actually people are seriously considering trying to have other planets, <laughs> which is so crazy. Um, there's also this like, let's just find the level line and just like not not do more. Let's just keep a steady rate. But that's also kind of a fantasy too, because as I said yesterday, if we just start start sustaining where we are right now, like we're at a really bad spot. So that's also not really possible. It's not. Uh, likely. Worst case scenario is that it comes down as fast as it went up. Now that's that's what's reflected in, in pretty much every population study ever and so that's what freaks people out and because it's such a difficult thing to perceive a lot of people don't even want to think about it. They're just like oh, la, 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 I don't want to hear it. Um, and that's the ugly picture you know that's like that's famine that's a lot of people dying because um, they just can't get what they need to survive. And where we're trying to figure out like, how we can approach this is to make that curve a little bit softer so that maybe it's not like um, so, so detrimental to so many people that we're actually designing our descent, that we're actually like, and through other things, like another really contestable and debatable thing is like population control. Like how do we go from exponential growth to this sort of gentle decrease okay there's no one answer to that but what we can consider as a possibility is that we can be creative about how that happens so it's not so bad and what we have to look towards are a couple examples 
Um, and the one that I'll, I'll speak to specifically is Cuba. Okay. So I'm, I'm not an expert on this. I'll just kind of share what I understand. So um, our country uh, majorly interrupted Cuba's participation in the global economy. And what we did is restrict, we made it illegal for other countries, maybe with a few exceptions, to import oil. So they experienced peak oil uh, really quickly as a result of this influence from the United States of America. And so what they needed to do is to adapt really quickly to a food system and a culture that is far less fuel dependent. And it probably wasn't pretty, but it's actually an example of how it can be done mass-scale implementation of local gardens, a lot of food production being done even in the urban environment, uh, reuse culture shifting big time because we didn't just block them really from importing oil, we blocked them from importing automobiles too, so that's why you see all those like 1950s cars still running in Cuba, because those are the ones they had, they had to fix them up. So really interesting case study on how uh, descent from dependence on oil can be possible. <coughs> Different circumstance. How did they run the little cars? They had fuel, but not a lot of it. Oh. Yeah, and again, I don't know the details. You know, it's not like uh, people stopped driving in Cuba, um, but the embargo that was put on Cuba made it really difficult for them to, to gain access to the global marketplace. And that's the, uh, the elementary version of the story that, that I'm aware of. Um, and so this, this, uh, way of living where we're much more intimately connected with our local food production is that soft landing. Because there's really not another way to do it. Uh, we have to get off of being a fossil fuel dependent food production and transportation system. Okay. It's, it's sort of the imperative. And so where permaculture really kind of comes in the picture is that um, our goal uh, to figure out how we can grow food close enough and still meet the needs of where we're at. So for example, the city of Portland doesn't hugely encourage that agricultural production happening right in the city because part of what Portland, um, you know, as like uh, in, in terms of planning needs to figure out is the density piece. There's a lot of examples of city growth is that they just spread and so that's eating up a lot more land area which is potentially um, usable for local agriculture. Portland has kind of opted this different uh, approach where, and it's a tri-county effort, uh, it's the urban growth boundary, which says that, hey, you know what, let's not eat up all of this uh, farmland and forest all around us like a lot of other cities have. Let's grow up and maintain that. So uh, this is like, you know, an example of a farm in the city, and it's really small, you know, our production's pretty low, uh, but really Portland's model is to have a lot of agricultural production right beyond the edge of the city. and so. Um, that's good, that's helpful, but it has to be even more personal than that. And like a lot of the agricultural production that's happening, if it's organic, it's still probably not sustainably organic. You know, if you drive through California and if you drive through uh, Bunny Love Farm, oh, thank you very much. One of the best tasting raspberries. <laughs> you notice that Bunny Love Farm is virtually in the desert. Has anybody driven past Bunny Love Farm? You know, that cute little package with the bunny on it? Uh, that is an organic farm that's basically relying on major organic imports, so fertilizer, I mean, uh, like compost, which is like the biological fertilizer, coming in by the truckload to be able to produce food in the desert. That system is not sustainable, so it's not just organic. Organic takes care of a lot of the problems, but we also have to take care of um, our soil in place. It's one of the efforts here that Henry will speak to a little bit later on this afternoon. It's how we're trying to reduce our dependence increasingly on outside inputs, doing what nature does best, which is one of the most glorious patterns, which is that it doesn't waste anything. It generates what it needs. And uh, so how do we mimic that? How do we uh, grow soil, literally? It's, a, it's a, something that we're just kind of relearning to do. And what permaculture does that no other sort of like uh, design science has done is it takes and kind of gives equal uh, weight and validity to two very different uh, ways of knowing. One being uh, what I would call the farmer or the naturalist's knowledge. <clears throat> These are people who are on the land 
day to day, year to year, and know the patterns, um, you know, have a really deep understanding of what's going on. And it's not like a textbook knowledge. It might not be like knowing like the actual intimate parts of things, but it is. It's it's highly reliable because of that uh, observation over time. Okay, that coupled with what we do know scientifically about soil and chemical processes and climate and all that stuff, like if we can successfully take those two ways of knowing and, and weave them together, that's probably our, our, our greatest hope. All right, so uh, there is a sciencey edge to permaculture because it's helpful to know the little pieces and there's a huge amount of weight put on the big picture, the big pattern. Uh, because without having that big picture, all this little tinkering just gets us into more and more trouble. And arguably, that's uh, where science has not not served us uh, in in the highest way possible. Because it hasn't had that ethical foundation that you all know about now. So that's a brief history <laughs> of agriculture, and um, not one answer, but uh, part of a uh, way of addressing issues. In, in the field of permaculture is that if you're going to have inputs, plan so that those inputs create a situation of reliance, self-reliance afterwards. So use the machine to make the pond so that you can have access to water on your landscape or you know use the current access to finances to bring in a bunch of compost to get yourself set up so that your system's up and running, right? It's not that you shouldn't use these things. It's like use them as a way to not need them anymore. So locally, where would you? So oh, if you need to yeah. purchase... They're suppliers. I like Dean's Innovations. They've got an organic certified compost. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, there are others. Um, let's see. I don't want to lose a train of thought here. Um, Larry okay. Santoyo, who is a really kind of bombastic permaculture teacher from the Bay Area. Uh, his teaching style is like, if, he says if he's not pissing you off, he's not trying hard enough. So he really tries to get under your skin to, um, you know, help you get over yourself. That's, that's the style. Uh, it works for some people. And uh, he says, it's not that we shouldn't be using oil. We just need to use it to lift the heavy shit. The rest we can do with our hands, right? And um, we don't know really how to get back to uh, human labor by choice as a model for uh, getting work done. You know, animal culture, is that something that we want to revive? You know, that's a conversation. Um, how can we grow the quantity of food that we need without fossil fuels, without indentured servitude or slavery, and uh, what are our options? You know, it becomes a little bit tricky, but really the solution is that a lot more people need to be participating in that process for it to work. Um, and what we kind of talk about in this course with urban permaculture is even though um, the city is not going to be fed from gardens in the city, it's not a bad idea to develop a relationship with plants and get to understand some of those processes so that you're capable. Right? And some people uh, are turning to being seed keepers and trying to keep varieties from being lost because the majority of the fruits and vegetables, maybe specifically the vegetables, that you might purchase in a supermarket, 70 to 90 percent of the varieties are lost. They're gone. So uh, part of what's driven this whole system is that like the shelf life of it for transportation, uniform size, these are all pressures on the food crops and what's being lost is the flavor, what's being lost is the nutrition. <laughs> yeah. Um, the nutrition. And so how do we keep the varieties and the, and the whole thing with GMO, I mean this isn't a, like I said, there could be a million different avenues that we can go with this presentation but um, now we're even dealing with a food system that's increasingly genetically modified, which are owned. That genetic information is owned by the corporation. And the system that we're in right now is that if the GMO pollen from the GMO farm contaminates a non-GMO crop, and they find out that the non-GMO farmer has GMO genes in their field, that farmer is liable for patent infringement, and they can be sued and they can lose their farm. It's a form of warfare. So is there a way to test your soil? Oh yeah, there are labs uh, all across the country that can test your soil. They can give you spectrum of um, available nutrients, what amendments they recommend. You can indicate general vegetable or you can tell them what you want to grow and they'll recommend different amendments. Henry will talk about amendments today so I'm not going to get too much into that. Do, do yeah. you know if anybody's countersued Monsanto for contaminating Oh yeah, they get countersued all the time okay, but like they have such a, a massive yeah. litigation team. I mean. 
part of part of how Monsignor is able to do what they do is because they not just can afford the best lawyers, but their previous employees and executives are literally the judges. Are literally the judges. Have you ever seen the the graphic on the revolving door between uh, the federal courts and Monsanto and like offices? It's just man. Like I said, a lot of branches to this conversation. What we find is like this um, Columbia River of an issue of agricultural um, production and how we do that. There are many, many, many branches that are influencing it. Yeah. Yeah.